Thank you, Reverend Hughes, members of Pilgrim UCC, I'm pleased to be with you again today, grateful for the invitation, and honored to bring greetings from President Stephen Ray and my colleagues at Chicago Theological Seminary. We are grateful for your support and collaboration in God's work of reconciling humanity and sustaining creation. On this Higher Education Sunday, we particularly think of the need together to engage in the identification and development of leaders both within the church and out of the church in the world, both ordained and lay, who will contribute to the increase of justice and, justice and mercy. I'm glad to be here. And with the help of our passages from Scripture, from the scroll of the prophet Jeremiah and from the Gospel according to Mark, I'd like to reflect, reflect with you briefly on silencing and shouting, as in many sternly ordered Bartimaeus to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly. Silence and shouting have a complex relationship. Shouting can be a way to silence others. We know this all too well. We shout one another down. We shout so another cannot be heard. We shout, shut up. We shout, like the many on the road out of Jericho, be quiet. But we can also cry out for help. We shout, no justice, no peace. We break silence and shout out long hidden truths. And there is both silencing and choosing silence. We can refuse to shout in order to hear. We can quiet ourselves so another can come to voice. With these tensions in mind, let us first consider silencing in our present moment. These are contentious days. We live in echo chambers. We can and often do listen only to those with whom we know we already agree. We are saturated in lies and insults, falsehoods and fake news. And there are powerful people who do not want to hear, who know that their precarious privilege may be threatened if protest is aired, if injustice is named and confronted. The forces that silence are vindictive the forces that silence are powerful and entitled. The forces that silence are legion and violent. Recall Colin Kaepernick. Unable to respond to acts of brutality against black bodies by those sworn to serve and protect. Unable not to respond to acts of brutality against black bodies by those who are sworn to serve and protect. Colin used his visibility as an NFL athlete to highlight the unequal justice so prevalent in our country. He did not shout. He simply took a knee. His was a silent gesture that spoke volumes. And in this so-called land of liberty, so-called home of the brave as a problem, was all he was trying to say. Though singularly talented, he lost his job perhaps his career. The NFL owners now threaten teams with fines if a player follows Colin in this silent shout-out. These men are gladiators, can batter their bodies for our entertainment, but they have no First Amendment rights on the field. The forces that silence are indeed vindictive. Recall next Christine Blasey Ford, she had a terrible secret that she had no intention of making public. But then Brett Kavanaugh was named as President Trump's second nominee for Supreme Court Justice. That was more than she could stand. She wrote to Diane Feinstein, and when it was clear that Kavanaugh was about to sail through the hearings, she agreed to testify. Haunted by death threats, unable to live in her own home, she made a plausible case. She spoke up and spoke out. How would Kavanaugh respond? He made a decision to defend himself with righteous indignation. He insisted not so much that Professor Blasey Ford was not to be believed, 
but that she should not have spoken, not jeopardized his elevation from federal judge to Supreme Court justice. He clearly felt that he deserved this high honor. He had been told all his life that he would be a justice, and he apparently believed it. So she should hold her tongue so as not to ruin his life, or so we were to believe. Never mind that silencing her, dismissing her testimony to ensure a conservative majority on the court for decades to come, communicated all too clearly to so many women, to all who have suffered unwanted sexual advances and sexual violence of all kinds, that they should be silent, that they were not going to be believed. The forces that silence are indeed powerful and entitled. Finally, recall Laquan McDonald. He was silenced by 16 bullets. He was silenced by the blue wall that told a different story from the dash, dash cam video. He was silenced by a mayoral incumbent who ensured that we would not see the footage until well after the election. And oddly enough, it was this same mayor who suddenly announced he would not run again as the trial was about to break all this silence. We breathe a sigh of relief and give thanks for the verdict of guilty second-degree murder for Officer Jason Van Dyke, for this small sign that some measure of justice and accountability is possible. But we have a long way to go before it is clear that black lives matter. One can still be silenced for being black and driving, for being black and playing with a toy gun, for being black and selling a cigarette, for being black and having barbecue in a relative's backyard, for being black and simply being in one's own home. The forces that silence are indeed legion and violent. Bartimaeus was silenced. There was Jesus and the disciples in a large crowd leaving Jericho. Bartimaeus had heard about this Jesus. He had heard that this itinerant rabbi had wonder-working powers, that wherever Jesus went, the lame could walk again, the hungry were fed, lives were transformed. He hoped that Jesus could help him, could give him back his sight, could free him from a life of begging for money for food. Why should he not cry out? It was likely noisy and chaotic. There was no need to be decorous, to suffer in silence. Why did so many order him to be quiet? Was he obnoxious, unsightly, dirty, smelly? Or was he simply unimportant? unworthy of help, undeserving of Jesus' time and attention. Bartimaeus was ordered to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly. What did he do, Pilgrim? He was told to be silent, but he... Shouting can silence. We can shout over. We can shout, shut up. But we can also shout, mercy, help me, see me, hear me. We can shout, justice now. We can shout, love is love is love is love. Despite being scolded, Bartimaeus cries out as loud as he possibly can, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus heard his cry. Jesus stopped and was moved and decided to meet this one who knew him as son of David. And Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And the many who had ordered Bartimaeus to be quiet saw him now with fresh eyes. They changed their tune profoundly. They say to him, 
take heart. Get up. The teacher is calling for you. Do you, do we have eyes to see and ears to hear, Pilgrim? Because Jesus heard Bartimaeus cry for mercy, they no longer ordered him to be quiet. Indeed, astonishingly, the many now console this filthy beggar. When Jesus hears him, take heart, they say now. You have been heard, they say now. Jesus is calling for you, they say now. What a different environment we would conjure if we all stopped ordering each other to be quiet and instead say, take heart. You have been heard. You have been believed. You matter. How can I help you? And as Jesus asked Bartimaeus himself, what do you want me to do for you? Such words are not just for individuals, but for peoples and nations. Such are the words from the Lord that we heard from Jeremiah. He counsels those long in exile to keep hope alive. He casts a vision that eases despair. We, as community, as city, as state, as nation, could use a bit of that now, could we not? It certainly feels to me in these days that God's promise through Jeremiah is far, far off. But one day, he assures us, the remnant will return in joy with shouts of praise to the God of rescue and freedom. Recall the prophet's words. With weeping they shall come. With consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they will not stumble. No one is to hold back. No one is told to be silent. There are shouts of gratitude and joy. We are far from such a day. Yet we must, we can, we must hold on to the promises that exile is not forever, that justice will roll down, that the face of the earth will be renewed, and that all shall be well. Why? Because there is one, this Jesus, this Son of David, who hears the loud and desperate cry, Have mercy. He changes our mean-spirited murmurs of be quiet to the consolation of take heart. He asks Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? Bartimaeus regains his sight. This healing, this liberation from a life of begging, took someone able to hear the cry for mercy above the din and to stop and to attend and to ask what was needed. It took a crowd moving from shut up to take heart. And it took an audacious beggar who knew what he needed and had faith enough in this Jesus to keep on shouting. In these mean and divisive days, yet full of confident hope, we might do well, like Jesus, to stay centered enough to hear the cries for mercy. We might do well, like the crowd, to stop silencing those who suffer and to console them instead. We must never quit crying out in need and for justice. But there's also a time to hush up, the better to listen, the better to hear the shouts of those we have silenced and ask humbly, O oh Lord, what shall we do? What shall we do? Somebody, indeed, is calling all of our names. Let us sing.